Now, I'd like you to turn in the Word of God to the first book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3. You'll find it on page 237. If you're in the kind of front row where you don't have a Bible in front of you, I'm sure someone behind you will pass you a Bible. People in the second rows help those in the front rows. And uh, let's turn to page 237, 1 Samuel chapter 3. This is the most well-known part of the Samuel story, and you will have learned this in Sunday school, um, I am sure. Let's just pray together before we turn to this passage. God, our Father, thank you so much for your precious word, and thank you for this account of you speaking to a young man, a young boy, revealing yourself making yourself known, making your word heard. And Lord, it's our prayer that this morning as we turn to this passage, that as Samuel heard your voice, we might hear your voice yet again speaking by the Holy Spirit through the scriptures. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. As I am speaking to you this morning, our daughter Sarah is in the air flying from Addis Ababa to Juba in South Sudan, where she's going to be serving with a Christian humanitarian organization called Mede. Some of you are aware of the dire situation in South Sudan. A massive famine caused by a combination of war and a drought. Irene and I watched it documentary on South Sudan a few weeks ago, and it showed that the situation in some places, because of those two factors, war and drought, is so serious that women are gathering grass and boiling it and feeding their children on grass because there is nothing to eat. It's a desperate, heartbreaking situation. But there's a kind of famine that is equally, if not even more, terrible. And it's a famine that the prophet Amos spoke about in Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Amos warned his hearers that God would be silent. It would be like a terrible famine with people going everywhere, searching for a word from God. And... When Samuel came on the scene, that was the spiritual situation in Israel. In chapter three, verse one, notice the text there. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. In those days, God was silent. And God's silence was the judgment of God because of the corrupt leadership of Israel as we saw in the last chapter and because of the sins of God's people. God withdrew the light of his word and so his people were kind of stumbling around in the darkness, the darkness that they apparently preferred to the light of God's word. Now there was no shortage of religion at that time. The tabernacle was in Shiloh, it was a busy place. Activities were going on, people were coming as Elkanah and Hannah and their family did, but the word of the Lord was rare. I think sadly, the same is to some extent true in our own country and on our own continent, and it's true in many parts of the world, even the Western world. There's plenty of religion. There's services where people Sing and sing and sing and sing and sing. 
where they pray and pray and pray for the meeting of material needs, where they shout and scream at demons, but where the word of God is not read and the word of God is not preached, the word of God is not heard, the word of God is rare. But before we point fingers at other people, which is fairly easy to do, we need to ask ourselves, is the word of God rare in our lives? Oh, we have it. I can't tell you how many different Bible translations I have, and some of you have tons of them on your phone, or you have access via the internet just with a press of the finger to Bible translations in many languages, many different translations, but, but it's possible to have the word of God at our fingertips and for it to be rare in our lives. Do we read it? Do we study it? Do we meditate on it? Do we think about it? Do we come to hear it preached regularly? Was this just maybe one of five Sundays where you happen to be here? It's the word of God rare in our lives. That's a, that's a challenge even to me. Now the passage before us this morning begins on a very gloomy note, as we've seen. Verse one, in those days the word of God was rare. But it ends on a glorious note. If you look down to the end of the chapter and trespass over into the beginning of the fourth chapter, you'll notice that it changes. Verse 21, the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. So there we have those bookends to this section. The gloomy beginning, the word of God was rare. The glorious ending of the chapter, the word of God was revealed to Samuel and Samuel's word came to all Israel. So something changed between those bookends. Something changed between verse one and verse 21. And it's a story of God speaking, of God speaking to a boy who was probably about 12, maybe a little bit older. Boy named Samuel, who, according to chapter three, verse one, ministered before the Lord under Eli. So we want to look at this chapter, and we want to look at it under three headings. We're going to think about encounter, experiencing the living God. We're going to see assignment, obeying the living God, and then we're going to focus on ministry, serving the living God. So let's start with encounter, experiencing the living God. It begins in verse two. One night, one night, one night, Samuel had a life-changing encounter with the Lord. And the context of that encounter is significant. The words chosen by the writer describe the setting in which that encounter took place. And it's a, it's a setting full of meaning. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. So once again, we see a contrast. There's a contrast here between old Eli and young Samuel. Eli was old, and he was fat. How do we know that? Well, chapter four, verse 18, says that he was heavy. That's another way of saying fat. <laughs> so he was old and he was fat and he was nearly blind. And he represents the kind of state of spirituality in Israel at that time. Not a very happy picture. He presided over Israel as high priest and under his leadership, things were in a state of spiritual decline. Samuel, on the other hand, represents the grace of God, bringing renewal, bringing new life through his word. We're told in the text in verse three that the lamp of God was burning. 
the lamp of God. We'll pop a picture on the screen. The lamp of God there on the, on the right. The seven-branched menorah or seven-branched golden candlestick called a menorah. And that candlestick stood in the holy place, not the inner sanctum, the holy of holies. It stood in the holy place, which in the tabernacle was the place immediately outside the veil. It was the only source of light in the holy place. And the priests were responsible to make sure that that light burned from evening until morning, providing light in the holy place all the way through the night. And the fact that the text says that the lamp of God had not yet gone out indicates that probably it was the early hours of the morning when this took place. The oil was running low, but it hadn't yet gone out. The lamp was a symbol, as all the, thing, all the parts of the tabernacle were. The lamp was a symbol of the light of God's truth given to the world through his people Israel. And the sad thing is that the lamp of God's word, the light of God's word was burning dimly in Israel at that time. The word of God was rare. The ark of God, and picture up there, I put that picture there deliberately because some of you, when I talk about the ark, you think of Noah's ark, didn't you? Well, that's not Noah's ark. This is the, the ark of the covenant. And the ark of the covenant was a, a box, a gold-plated box on the lid of the box, which was called the, the mercy seat or the atonement cover or two cherubim with their wings out touching each other. That was the only piece of furniture, if you like, in the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctum, where the visible manifestation of the presence of God, the Shekinah glory, was manifest. And the ark was there. Inside that ark were the tablets of the law that God had given to Moses on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments. And even though the law was there in the Ark of the Covenant, the people, for the most part, were disobeying that law. We read in the earlier chapter how Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were committing adultery with the woman who served at the tent of meeting, just meters away from the place where the law of God, which forbade adultery, was kept. And that night, Eli, we're told, was lying down in his usual place, probably a room adjacent to the tabernacle. But Samuel was lying down, the text says, in the temple or the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was. He wouldn't have been in the most holy, in, in the holy of holies, because only the high priest could go in and that only once a year. And he wouldn't have been in the holy place, but probably as near as he could get, indicating something of his desire for God. So the tabernacle represented God's dwelling among his people. So here we see young Samuel with the lamp of God still burning, the tabernacle of the Lord still standing, the ark of God in its place. It's early hours of the morning, still dark, and the scene is set for an encounter with the living God. And in verses four to eight, we have the call. Then, the text says, then on that night, in that context, then the Lord called Samuel. And he called him in the most dramatic way. Read, let's read from verse four. Then the Lord called Samuel, Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. 
The Lord called Samuel a third time, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. So each time the Lord called, and he probably called in an audible voice, whether the voice was audible to others or only to Samuel, we don't know. But each time he called, Samuel ran with those words, here I am. And those words are the response of a servant to the call of his or her master. And the servant is saying, here I am, give me your instructions, I'm ready to do your will, I'm ready to obey. It's interesting, when God called Abraham, Abraham's response was, here I am. When God called Moses at the burning bush, Moses' response was, here I am. When God called Isaiah in Isaiah chapter six, Isaiah's response was, here I am. And when he calls Samuel, Samuel's response is, here I am. When I say that, I think this needs to be the, you might say the posture of our hearts as servants of Christ. There's a sense in which when we wake up in the morning, before we get out of bed to get that first cup of coffee, we should look up to God and say, Lord, here I am. Here I am at your service today to be used to fulfill your purpose today. Lord, here I am, ready to do your will. It should be my response whenever God speaks or commands through his word. Lord, here I am. I will obey. It should be my response when I sense that, that nudge of the Holy Spirit to do something for God, to serve someone. Lord, here I am. I'm available. Now, why did Samuel not know that it was the Lord speaking to him? Look at verse seven. The answer's provided for us there. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The message translation puts it this way. This all happened before Samuel knew God for himself. It was before the revelation of God had been given to him personally. So this makes the simple point that Samuel had not heard God speak to him before this time. Samuel was, you might say, Israel's brightest and best He was this young man that had been given by his mother to God. He had grown up in the the temple under the uh, tutelage of Eli, and yet he didn't know God. He knew a lot about God. Uh, He believed in God, no doubt about that. But the text says he did not yet know him. God had not personally revealed himself and spoken to, to Samuel yet. But this was about to change. God was about to come and to speak. And a a relationship with God always begins when God speaks to us through his gospel by his spirit. Now, I would guess that some of you here today are kind of like Samuel was that night, that you may not yet know the Lord. It doesn't mean that you don't believe doesn't mean that you don't know about him, but you may not yet have a personal relationship with him. You may not yet have had an encounter with God. And my hope and prayer this morning is that through God's word, you will hear God calling you to himself and that you will respond as Samuel did, here I am. That is, will change absolutely everything. Look at the counsel that Eli gave to Samuel in verse eight, second part of verse eight into verse nine. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So he told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. It dawned on old Eli that something was happened that was happening that hadn't happened in Shiloh for a long time. God was speaking. God was speaking. 
he realized that Samuel was hearing the voice of God, that Samuel was, in the words of the text, calling the boy. So he gives this wise counsel, go and lie down, and when he calls again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And this is, this is kind of a model prayer, isn't it? For all who seek to follow God's will, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. This should be our prayer when we open our Bibles in the morning to read. As you open the book to wherever you're reading, wonderful prayers. Say, Lord, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. When you come into this place to hear the word of God preached, what a wonderful prayer. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. When you're needing direction for a, an important life decision, what better prayer than speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Wonderful, wonderful model prayer for us as believers. Here I am. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. The question that Irene and I are asked most these days is, what are you gonna do after you finish at Rosebank at the end of 2018? And our answer is, whatever God tells us to do. And so the posture of our hearts and the prayer on our lips is very simply, speak, Lord, you know, for your servants are listening. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Here we are, we'll do whatever you tell us to do. Uh, and that's a wonderful place to be. We used to sing that old hymn, where he leads me, I will follow. And that's kind of the, the motto of our lives. Where he leads me, I will follow. What he feeds me, I will swallow. Uh, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. That's a, that's a great place to be. I hope that that is the prayer that is pretty much uppermost in your heart. The change came in verse nine and onwards. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Look at verse 10. And the Lord came and stood there calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Whenever God engaged deeply with a person in scripture, that their name was often repeated twice. Simon, Simon. Abraham, Abraham, Moses, Moses, Samuel, Samuel. God comes to him and Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. He left out Lord. Let's not be too hard on him. This was his first time. Maybe he was a little bit uncertain. Is this the Lord? <laughs> but at last, the encounter happened. The voice of God was heard and Samuel came to know the Lord. His life was changed forever. The boy became the prophet. Encounter with God. But encounter with God led to an assignment for God. Verses 11 to 18. And two things happen here. God's word is received by Samuel and God's word is relayed to Eli. Let's look at verse 11. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. Quite expressive, isn't it? Ever heard something and it just used the ear? <laughs> I just, I just can't believe that. Whoa. That's the, the picture here. God says, I'm gonna do something in Israel that is gonna make the ears of all who hear about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, 
the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Whew. What a heavy word to be revealed by God to a young teenager. Wow. I doubt that Eli had previously shared with Samuel what God had said to him back in chapter two through that man of God who came to him, verses 27 to 34 of chapter two. But the word that God now gives to Samuel confirms what God had earlier said to Eli through that unnamed prophet that came to him with that message of judgment that we looked at last week. The Lord didn't command Samuel to tell this to Eli, but it's implicit. He certainly expected this message to be passed on. What an assignment for a young, brand new prophet. As we look at what God said to Samuel, two questions I think naturally arise if you read that text carefully in its context. And the first question is this, and maybe it's already popped into your mind. Isn't it a bit harsh? Isn't God perhaps overreacting here and being unfair to Eli? An Australian scholar by the name of John Woodhouse uh, says this in answer to that kind of question. He says, the judgment of God against human wickedness is always a terrible thing to contemplate. It is hardly possible for us, embroiled as we are in the sinfulness of humanity, to see clearly the rightness of God's ways. It is very important for us to take care here and to humbly listen to the word of God, not passing judgment on it, but allowing it to illumine our minds. By the standards we might apply to ourselves, Eli was not an excessively wicked man. His various failures, such as mistaking Hannah's prayer for drunken mumbling, his inability to curb his sons, and his slowness to, in recognizing that God was speaking to Samuel, are readily attributable to his advancing years. We can think of plenty excuses for Eli, for he was, we might feel, no worse than any of us. And there are things we admire in, in Eli. The trouble with all this is that Eli is not being judged by us. It is the Lord who said that his sons were blaspheming and that he did not do what he should have done to restrain them. It is not for us, John Woodhouse says, to sit in judgment over the Lord. He is, as Hannah prayed back in chapter two, verse three, he is the God of knowledge and by him deeds are weighed. I thought those were wise words. Very, very wise words. Another question arises and that's what is the meaning of verse 14? Look at the text. God says, because of the sins of Eli's sons and Eli's sins, therefore, verse 14, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. What is God saying here? He's saying simply that there's no forgiveness for them. No forgiveness. Why? You see, the worst of the rotten things that the sons of Eli did was to treat with contempt the very provision God had made for sins to be forgiven through the offerings and sacrifices that pointed forward to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the world. And if they spurned the very means that God had given for sins to be forgiven. How else could their sins be forgiven? 
And that's what God is saying here in verse 14. There can be no forgiveness if you spurn the way of forgiveness that God has made known. The New Testament recognizes the same reality. If you reject the death of Jesus Christ for your sins and you seek to be saved by your own good works and your own righteousness, you are doing exactly what Eli's sons did and you are putting yourself in exactly the same peril. Hebrews chapter 10 warns about that. That if you spurn the cross of Christ, there is no way that you can be forgiven because it is only through the death of Christ that forgiveness can be granted. And so I think that's the meaning of verse 14. So God's word is received by Samuel. Now it needs to be shared, needs to be relayed. And given the severity of the message, verse 15 comes as no surprise. Look at verse 15. Samuel lay down until morning. doesn't say he slept. I doubt whether he slept. Samuel lay down until morning and then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. So he gets up and he gets dressed and he goes about the business as, as an apprentice priest, opens up the doors of the house of the Lord. But notice what the text says. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. I don't blame him. I mean, here he was, a teenager, Eli was old and he had been the mentor. He was the high priest. And now imagine you have this message from God that you have to convey to your mentor. Mm. And so he keeps quiet. But Eli knew that God had spoken to Samuel and he wanted to know what God had said. He wanted to know everything he'd said. Look at verse 16. But Eli called to him, Samuel, my son, Samuel answered, here I am. What was it he said to you, Eli asked? Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely. That was a, a common Hebrew expression, almost a kind of a curse. You asking for trouble if you hide this, God's gonna deal with you. If you hide from me anything he told you, verse 18, so Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. I imagine his mouth would have been dry, his tongue would have felt like a bit of shoe leather in his mouth as he little by little poured out everything that God had said to him. He faithfully did that. One of the things that as Christian witnesses and as preachers of the gospel deal with is the fact that God's message often has a hard side to it. Even the gospel message, for example, even if you take John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It's very easy for us to speak or share John 3, 16, but to skip over the word perish. I'm not talk about that side of it. Oh, God loves you so much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's wonderful. That's, a, that's the easy part. The, the shall not perish part is the, is the tough part. The gospel is both bad news and good news. And we always face the danger of wanting to share the good news, but uh, kind of hide the bad news. Talk about heaven, not talk about hell. Talk about grace, not talk about judgment. And it's a temptation that we as preachers face. The temptation to camp on the parts of scripture that are, that are easy to listen to that encourage and uplift and that make people walk out thinking, hey, this is great, God lo loves me. But to downplay and even ignore the tough parts. The apostle Paul, you remember when he was bidding farewell to the elders in the church at Ephesus, reflecting on his time of ministry among them, he'd been among them three years, he said to them, I have not hesitated to share with you 
everything that was, would be helpful to you. I have declared to you the whole counsel of God. That's our responsibility as witnesses. That's our responsibility as preachers. And like Samuel, we can be afraid to share the tough part. Ralph Davies, in his wonderful commentary on 1 Samuel says this, there is always a tension in the word of God and any authentic messenger of that word knows and lives in it. If a preacher, for example, never places you under the criticism of God's word, never tells you your sin, but smothers you with comfort, you must wonder if he is a phony. If his preaching contains only the judgment note and seldom offers comfort and encouragement, you must ask if he actually cares for people. If one has a high regard, both for the truth of God, even if it's judgment, and for the troubles of people, he will retain a proper tension in the biblical word. He will both afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. That's my job as a preacher, is to afflict the comfortable and to comfort the afflicted. I've sometimes said that I have to wear two hats. I have to wear the prophet hat, which says, this is where the bar is. This is the standard. This is the will of God. But I also have to wear the pastor hat that understands your frailty as I understand my own. And getting that balance is a challenge for all of us because we all like to share the good news. And here was Samuel, his first assignment was to share the bad news and he did it faithfully. Now, how did Eli respond to the word to him through the young prophet Samuel? Look at the end of verse 18. Then Eli said, he is the Lord, let him do what is good in his eyes. Huh, that was Eli's response. He is the Lord, let him do what is good in his eyes. One of the things you discover as you read Bible commentaries, and I think I'm using eight or nine in my preparation for this series, is that Bible scholars don't always agree. And this is one area where there's some disagreement about how we should interpret Eli's response. Bill Arnold, for example, says, Eli responds with gloomy resignation. He is the Lord, let him do, as, let him do what is good in his eyes. Bill Arnold says that's gloomy resignation. Warren Wiersbe says, Eli's response is passive resignation. John Woodhouse, on the other hand, the Australian, says this may have been Eli's finest moment as he acknowledged and accepted the rightness of God's judgment. Now, who's right? And we had time to be fiddle around with this. We could make a case for, case for both. Uh, I kind of favor the last one, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I do believe, though, that Eli's response is at times the godly response, the right response for a true believer who knows God and knows the Scriptures. For example, it may be the right response when you face some mysterious trial, something that comes into your life that you didn't ask for, that is causing you pain, and it's, it's mysterious, there's a time to say, he is the Lord. Let him do as seems good to him. There's a time when that is the godly response. Another example would be when a, a prayer of yours isn't answered. And you've prayed and prayed and prayed about a particular thing, asking God to, to act on your behalf in a particular need that you have, and he doesn't answer that prayer. 
sometimes the right response is, it is the Lord. Let him do as seems good to him. I vividly remember on the morning my wife and sister were killed in a horrific car accident. They were traveling from the reef down to the coast with my sister's fiance. And I remember praying that morning that God would grant them safety as they traveled. And at eight o'clock that evening, Monty Sholand, who was then the principal of Rosebank Bible College, walked into the room, the rondavel that I was staying at on the old Rosebank campus, and he told me that they had been killed. And Monty and I knelt beside the bed in that rondavel, and by God's grace, the words that came out of my mouth were not dissimilar to Samuel's words. Lord, you gave and you have taken away. May your name be praised. There's a time to say, God, you are right. I don't understand it. I don't like it. But you're right. Another time to say this is when some beloved friend or family member who is not a Christian dies as far as you know without Christ. And you ask and you wrestle with that question, where are they? Have they gone to hell? Have they gone to heaven? And all your theology says, I have no reason to believe that they're in heaven. But all of your humanity says, I want to somehow believe that they are. That's the time where you say, you are the Lord. I trust you to do what seems good to you and to rest in his sovereignty. There's a lot that we can learn from that statement of Eli, whichever way it may be interpreted. Let's finish quickly with the ministry part of this. The final verses of the chapter are about ministry, serving the Lord. And Samuel's ministry was the first in, in a long line of distinguished prophets. And his ministry as a prophet began when he received this message from God and he relayed it to Eli. passage that began gloomy in verse one, the word of the Lord was rare, ends gloriously as Samuel's ministry is described. And look at the success of his ministry, verses 19 and 20. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and he let none of his words fall to the ground. Another translation puts it this way, he fulfilled everything Samuel prophesied. Verse 20, and all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet to the Lord. What on earth does that mean, all Israel from Dan to Beersheba? Who's Dan? Well, Dan was actually a town in the very north of Israel. Beersheba was the southernmost town in Israel. So it's just, just uh, the, the way of saying all Israel from top to bottom. If you're from England, you would say, from Land's End to John O'Groats, or as Africans, we say, from Cape to Cairo. It's kind of that expression. All Israel, from Dan to Beersheba. Only thing I remember about Beersheba, I was in Beersheba once, and uh, it was on Shabbat, Saturday. And I had been in Israel long enough to acquire quite a liking for Israeli ice cream. They make really good ice cream, and I love, I love ice cream. If anyone says to me, would you like a little ice cream? I say, no, I'd like a lot. Um, <laughs> and, I, and a friend of mine and I uh, were in Beersheba, and we had acquired a taste for Israeli ice cream. And the, if you want torture, be in Beersheba on Shabbat and look for an outlet where you can buy an ice cream. You can't. And we walked the length and breadth of Beersheba and ended up without having an ice cream. It was just, it was just terrible. Anyway, never mind that. But uh, coming back to Beersheba, 
all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet to the Lord. What was the, the reason? What was the secret of Samuel's success as a prophet? Look at verse 19. The Lord was with Samuel. That was it. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. It was God. It was God. And that's the secret of any success in ministry. Paul reminds us in Corinthians, and Conrad and Bear, we unpacked it brilliantly a couple of Sunday nights ago. One sows and another waters, but God makes it grow. Neither is he who sows nor he who waters anything, but only God who makes things grow. God's abiding presence, God's hand on Samuel explains the success of his ministry. What was the heart of his ministry? The heart of his ministry was the word of God. His ministry was the ministry of the word. God's word revealed to him and proclaimed by him. Look at verse 21. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Chapter four, verse one, and Samuel's word, which was God's word because it had been revealed to him by God. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. The famine was broken. The famine for God's word was broken. His word came to all Israel. In the New Testament, the apostle Peter, in his second letter, explains how that happened, how that worked. Second Peter chapter one, verse 20 and 21, listen to this. Peter says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's what happened to Samuel. That's what happened to the prophets who succeeded him. That's what happened to the apostles who succeeded them. Another classic definition of inspiration of the, the scriptures is given by, by Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God. I love that. All scripture is breathed out by God. We talk about the Bible being inspired, but that's actually not a very good way of saying it because inspiration means to breathe in. So if I go, that's inspiration. Expiration is, when we speak, we don't inspire, we expire. But the trouble is, with the word expiration, the undertakers and the librarians got a hold of it. And so if we start talking about the Bible as the expired book of God, uh, we get into trouble. But that's really what it's saying. That's why the, the, the translation, all scripture is breathed out by God. God has spoken. And he chose and he held on to and he guided the writers of the scriptures, the prophets and the apostles so that what they wrote was at once God's word and their word. And that's what we see happening with Samuel. God's word is revealed to him and Samuel's word went out to all Israel. And so the writer to the Hebrews could simply put it this way in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God spoke by the prophets. And just as God spoke to Samuel to provide a word for Eli, so also God spoke to the apostles and prophets to provide in this book his word to us. That's why the reformers would say, when scripture speaks, God speaks. So after years when the word of the Lord was rare, when there'd been a famine for hearing the word of God, God's people at last were able to come to Shiloh and hear the word of God. They came hungry 
and they listened to Samuel and they went away for. They came thirsty and they went away satisfied. They came broken and they went away healed. They came burdened and they went away uplifted. They came disoriented and they went away directed. They came guilty and they went away forgiven. That's what God's word does. And that's why God's word is so crucial. That's why Moses said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that's why reading this book and listening to this book and sharing this book is so very, very crucial. The point of this part of 1 Samuel is not that we should expect far less demand God speak to us in the way he spoke to Samuel. You and I are not in that category. It's a different time in history. God has spoken. He has spoken in his son. He has spoken in his word. He has spoken and we should listen and we should pass on that word to others in our families, in our circle of friends, in our church community, in our world, through our missionaries to the ends of the earth. That word needs to be passed on because it's the word that brings reformation and life. And if God's word is rare today, it's not because God is silent. It's not because God has not spoken. If God's word is rare in your life today, it is because of you. It's because of me. Because we have more time to fiddle on Facebook or do all sorts of other stuff to the neglect of this book. And so it's rare. Some of you, it's rare. Some of you haven't touched this book since this time last week. And you're living on grass when God has provided food for your soul. We need to have the heart of John Wesley who cried out, oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. The worst thing that can happen to you is to experience a famine of hearing the word of God. The worst thing that can happen to you is to live on grass when you could be living on food. Let's pray together. Pray today, Lord, for those people around the world who've never heard your word, who do not yet know you. And we pray for your blessing on every effort of ours and millions of others to make your word known to those who've not heard. Forgive us, Lord, as those who have the whole Bible in a language we can understand. Forgive us for neglecting it so that it's a rare thing in our lives. Create within us the hunger of Wesley. May we cry, oh, give me that book at any price. Give me the book of God. Give us the heart of Samuel. Here I am. Speak, Lord for your servant is listening. Amen.